Hi, I'm Dan Olson. Welcome to my YouTube channel. Um, at tonight's meetup, we had a really special guest, Mark Tarpenning, co-founder of Tesla, uh, who was there in the early days and shared advice uh, and stories from building the Tesla Roadster, their initial product. And a lot of our speakers talk about how to iterate products. Uh, he was basically sharing advice. Uh, what about when you're working on a product where it's not so easy to iterate? And again, he shared some great stories from Tesla. Probably a lot of facts you didn't know about the early days of Tesla, how very thoughtful they were about um, the problem they were trying to solve and the mission and why they have chose the Roadster as the first use case. So I think you'll enjoy the video. If you like it, please be sure to like the, hit the like button and subscribe and uh, so you can get notified about future videos. Thanks. So thank you uh, for coming out tonight. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about you know, Tesla and how we started it and what we thought about along the way and how we came up with a product that you couldn't iterate very quickly. So taking you on the sort of way back machine, in 2000, Martin Eberhard and I sold uh, our first company, which was a, an ebook company called Nuva Media. And I mean, it sounds ridiculous now, but it was really hard in the 90s to make ebooks. In fact, the most common refrain of when we were raising money is, no one is ever going to read on a screen. So like, this is never going to work. But you know, we worked on that and eventually uh, built a product that worked really well. We did do a bunch of iteration at the time because uh, we could. It was a small product, you know, relatively small. Uh, so wait. Let me fix that. There we go. Uh, and then afterwards, so we sold it in 2000. And then, as some of you may have known, we have, uh, may know, we had sort of a meltdown here in Silicon Valley <laughs> in 2000 <laughs> called the, the dot com, you know, thing. Uh, so that took several years to recover. And during that time, we did other stuff. But in 2003, we decided to go out and look for a new problem to solve. And you know that you're kind of an entrepreneur when you go out looking for problems. That's a new thing. Like most people don't do that. That's ridiculous. But we went looking and the problem that we got interested in was oil. And in 2003, you know, climate change was just barely on the horizon. But there was a lot of other things dealing with, with oil as well that we didn't like. So the neat thing about oil is it's lots and lots of problems wrapped into one substance. So there's clearly climate change, which now we know the full impact of. There's also uh, this idea of resource depletion at a given price point. So people, you know, there was this idea of peak oil. And that idea is actually not peak oil in an absolute sense. It's peak oil at a given price point. So, you know, there's plenty of oil at, you know, $500 a barrel. But how much is available at, you know, 20 or 30? And it depends on how much energy it takes to, to extract the oil. And there was a lot of issues around as the price gets higher, what that does to the world economy, because we were incredibly dependent on it. We're less dependent now, but we're still pretty dependent on it. That economics changes everything. You know, it, it, we send a lot of, lot of money out of the country in, in the US. Even now, people say, oh, we're making, you know, we, we produce more oil than Saudi Arabia. That is true, although we consume more than, you know, way more than that. Uh, so we still import a lot of oil every day. And then the politics. I used to live in the Middle East. I lived in the Middle East for six years. The Middle Eastern politics is very complicated, and it's made more complicated by the flow of, of oil money, and both you know, the flow of oil out and the money coming in. So and anyone who doesn't think that, that oil has stuff to do with the Middle East you know, po political situation, I think, just hasn't, hasn't lived there. So we really like the idea of trying to tackle something this big. We looked really carefully as to where oil was being used. And it turns out in this country, almost all the oil is used in transportation. And within transportation, it's almost all cars and, and light trucks. This was really good because when we did this research, we thought, well, you know, what, what if it turns out that it's all used in, you know, jet planes or something? Like we're not going to have electric jet planes or some, you know, solution to jet planes. But cars and trucks, we thought we had a chance at. So if we had a mission statement, which I will admit, we didn't actually write a mission statement that I remember. But it's basically to reduce oil consumption through personal, by, by changing personal transportation. That was, that was the goal. That was something that we, you know, again, we didn't necessarily write a mission statement, but we talked about it constantly. That was the goal. And that kind of mission-driven company really makes a difference. It makes it easier to recruit people. It makes it easier to stay motivated. There were days, you know, when things were not going well. And you think, oh, I just got to get to work because I actually am doing something that, that's important. So I don't know how many people have seen charts like this where you, you come up with an idea and you sort of idea and then you, you create a minimum viable product and you go out and you test it and you get a bunch of users and sometimes you even kind of lie to them and you say, this is, this is really what we're making, but you don't really think that's what you're making and you get feedback. 
and then you iterate, you change it. Like, how many people have done that or seen that? Yeah, it's like the normal thing, right? It's a super powerful idea. It builds some really great products, but it doesn't build big products like cars. You can't iterate like that. So I was researching for this talk and I actually looked up, I just, you know, Googled, you know, minimal viable product car, just to see what would come up. And, and this slide, which is, is attributed, so I think it's okay for me to, to show this. Uh, it, it has an attribution, uh, came up. And what I love is, so the idea is a car, right? Clearly it's a car. And the sort of MVP that, the, that they're saying, this is a great idea, is a, is a bicycle or a motorcycle. And then presumably you would iterate on that. And so you eventually got to the kind of car or the final product that you're interested in. I'm one of the few people on earth that's actually done this exercise. This does not work. I can just tell you, this is not, <laughs> this is not gonna be a solution. So, so what did we do? Because uh, we did you know, wonder about how we were gonna make this happen. So uh, we did it with a lot of research up front, a lot of research. EVs have been around for over a hundred years. Uh, in fact, they were uh, maybe not a third, they were about a third of vehicle sales at the turn of the last century, so the early 1900s. And we actually named all of our conference rooms after the failed EV country, companies of the early 1900s. As kind of a reminder that, you know, it seemed like a good idea at the time, but, you know, it didn't necessarily work. <laughs> so we wanted to make sure our intuition was that a battery electric vehicle was gonna be the answer, was gonna be the best to reduce oil consumption. But, you know, it turns out there's a lot of ways of reducing oil consumption. You know, there's, you know, um, various kinds of hybrids. There's uh, obviously biodiesels and, and, and ethanol and uh, hydrogen fuel cells. So we researched every single one of those fuels, you know, really quite deeply and looked at where the energy came from, how efficient it was, what kind of resources it used, to make sure that battery electric was gonna be the answer. So hydrogen fuel cells were really in in 2003. They were in for reasons I can't fully explain because the math does not make any sense as far as I can tell. But uh, the basic idea of a hydrogen fuel cell is you take hydrogen, you put it into um, a fuel cell, you get electricity out and water and you drive around. So it's zero emissions at the tailpipe, it's great. And hydrogen, as they like to point out, is the most abundant element in the universe. The problem is, is it's abundant out there in the universe. So we happen to live on a planet, right? And on a planet, the hydrogen is bound up. It's super reactive, which is why it's so great for a fuel cell. But it's bound up in things. It's bound up in, the, in this laptop and in my clothes and in water, which is the, the common way of getting it. And so you have to make hydrogen on this planet. There are no hydrogen mines. There's, there's no, you know, nothing that you can get out from the soil. If you just look at the energy efficiency of that, which we modeled very carefully, and then you, know, you, you produce the hydrogen, you then have to compress it and you lose a little bit along the way, and then you have to distribute it. And distributing hydrogen is like such a pain we couldn't figure out how to calculate it. So we said, okay, well, let's just imagine that it's magical and it's just where you need it. And then you put it back through a hydrogen fuel cell the theoretical efficiency of the hydrogen fuel cell is only 40%. So the energy in versus the energy out, you lose almost all the energy. And these are the theoretical maxes, assuming you have magical compressors and you make the hydrogen right there at your car and there's no transportation losses. If you simply take lithium ion cells, which we were familiar with from our ebook days and charge them, well, that's over 90% efficient. And then you pull the energy out of the lithium ion cell, that's over 90% efficient. So we were pretty sure that no matter what, even if they could make the hydrogen sort of more magically, you could still drive three times further that if you just took that original electricity and charged up existing batteries. So we were convinced that hydrogen fuel cells were never gonna get us because what we really didn't want to have happen is you know, four or five years down the road as we're introducing our product, somebody says, why didn't you use hydrogen? That's the obvious thing. The venture community was, was quite interested in our analysis and some of the VCs said, um, oh yeah, we know, we, look, we looked at that. And other VCs got real quiet when we would do the, our presentation around this. Uh, and they, they didn't do well in that portfolio. Ethanol was also quite, quite a big deal. Uh, and you know, again, it was sort of biomass in, and you go through some kind of process to make the ethanol and then you drive the car. And that was a simpler one. We thought, oh my gosh, a ton of biomass, you can drive a car for a certain distance. 
And then we realized, well, you know, if you just took that, and this is using fancy enzymatic um, processes that don't really exist, and they, they never really panned out in, in scale, but that, they, there was several companies pursuing this. And we looked at that and we said, well, you know, if you just took that same ton of biomass and somebody just burned it in an off-the-shelf generator and charged the car, we'd still go twice as far. So even if they don't, even if they came up with their magic uh, enzymatic stuff, it's still, you know, we'd still be, we just burn it all. You know, don't, don't do all that fancy chemistry, just burn it. We also, corn was a very big thing. We are the only nation on earth that uses corn for fuel. There is a reason for that. Uh, many people don't believe it's energy positive. They actually believe you, you end up negative with the energy. But if you listen to the proponents and you use their numbers, you get about 2,300 miles per acre of, of driving. And, you know, we're really good at growing corn. So we did worry about that. And I said, well, maybe the farmers will just simply grow all the fuel we need. So this is the amount of arable land in America, according to the CIA, which is a good source sometimes. Uh, and if you plant it all in corn, you could offset half the driving in America, assuming it's energy positive. And, you know, we're not so sure it really is, but it's just even assuming the proponents. So you would have to import 100% of our food, of course. And we thought, That's, this is not going to happen, right? I mean, I don't care how many votes there are in those corn states, you know, during the primaries. There's just not going to be, you know, we're not going to give up all of our food supply. So again, we weren't worried about that. And then the final thing that actually there was a bunch of investment going on in the, in the uh, valley with was uh, sort of cellulosic or cellu cellulosic ethanol produced with an enzymatic process. And it's much better. They never actually got this at scale, but conceivably you could get 51,000 miles per, per acre. Um, but still we thought about that as if you look at land use, instead of you know, using arable land, if you simply put existing PVs on an acre of desert, um, we could drive 32 times further. So no matter how we sliced it, electric cars were simply better, no matter what the fuel source was, no matter what, you know, no matter what the metric was, whether it was, whether it was um, you know, just total energy in, or whether it was acreage, or, or whatever the resource was, battery electric won. And not by a little bit, not by 10%, which is a very dangerous position to be in, but like two or three or 10 times or 32 times more efficient. So that really gave us confidence that battery electric vehicles were the actual answer. And of course, you don't need to use fossil fuels for a battery electric vehicle because you can do just about anything with them once the electrons are on the line. So here's the arable land. There's the best case enzymatic cellulosic, which nobody's been able to do. And there's what it would take in terms of our land and desert land to offset half the driving in America with photovoltaics. It actually really isn't very much. And this is an example of, you know, something that here is, is here in California that exists now. And this is actually old technology. We're, we're much more efficient now. So we knew that we weren't going to get blindsided, you know, four or five years out by some other technology we hadn't anticipated. That was really important because we can't iterate very quickly with cars. Potential market. Well, the car market is freaking gigantic, right? So you don't have to worry about that. And we had a, we looked at the two-seater sports car market, which we'll talk about in a moment. And but even that is a tiny, tiny slice of the U.S. market. And if you just look at cars in 2003 above, you know, the $75,000 price point, it's $3 billion worth. And the really neat thing about working with cars is all of that market information is available because people have to register their cars. So when you register your car, it goes to a public database. And you can see actually how many Priuses were registered in Palo Alto, like all of them. I think mean, all the cars in, at that time were Priuses. Um, so, but you could actually know that. You could know that for real. You could know individual, you know, little regions, as, and that marketing information is available, you know, for free, which was great because we didn't have any money, so that was perfect. Uh, the problem that we discovered, though, was that none of the cars that were being registered were electric cars. It was zero. The total electric car market in 2003 was, in fact, zero. So we looked at that really carefully and said, like, why, why is it that we, you know, we did all this analysis and electric cars were clearly the answer. Why weren't these cars selling? <laughs> now, and, and some of the, these people were in San Carlos, I think, uh, or Menlo Park or San Carlos. Is that, we used to go over and look at them. Um, these were all available in 2003. 
Yeah, and everyone's favorite. So, why do you think these were not selling? Anybody? They're ugly. They're, they're ugly. Safety. They're what? Fantastic, <laughs> Fantastic. yeah. They're, they're really lame. Like, I mean, you know, you, just, you, you sort of think about it. Um, Martin called these punishment cars. <laughs> that, that they were designed by people who hated the idea of people having cars. They liked bicycles and they liked, you know, public transportation. But if you had a car, you had to be punished for it. And this, this is, is what they looked like. <laughs> now, there had been some other cars on the market that, that had existed in California. So California passed the zero emissions mandate, which required uh, all the car companies, if you sold very many cars, which are all the major car companies in California, because we you know, sell a lot of cars in California, um, you had to have some percentage of your cars be zero emission. And that really meant electric. And they had all of these cars that were out and the car companies hated being forced to make these things. It's not what they wanted to do. So they were forced to make these things. And car companies spent a lot of time and effort not making electric cars, but lobbying in Sacramento. And it turns out that if you spend that time and effort in Sacramento, you can get the zero emissions mandate rewritten, which is what they were able to do. And in 2002, the emissions mandate gets rewritten and every single car was off the market immediately. Like it was over, like within a week, they were all over. And all of those cars were leased. So the leases were canceled and those cars were actually taken back and, and gotten rid of. Um, now, now, the two that stood out, the, all the other ones were terrible, but the two that were interesting was the EV1 that General Motors did for a whole variety of interesting reasons, but they actually made a decent car. And, and uh, the Toyota RAV4 uh, EV. And Toyota, even if they're forced to do something they don't want, you know, they don't do anything poorly, right? Toyota just doesn't do that. They're like, oh, our brand, you know, we'll just make it really nice. It will make it work really, really well. So their customers were incredibly devoted to their Toyota RAV4s. In fact, there's still some driving around. I see them every once in a while. And they went to Toyota and they said, you know, can we just, you know, we, we love our Toyota products. Can we keep it? And Toyota said, wow, okay, sure. You can you know, buy out the lease and you can just keep it. GM, however, decided that they, wanted to, they didn't allow that to happen. They needed to bring them all back and crush them in front of the owners. <laughs> and this is true, this is actually true. So for those of you in sort of marketing and stuff and, 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 and entrepreneurs uh, in general, if you have a product that you're selling that your customers love, do not get it back from them, sometimes with the marshals coming to your house and bringing, dragging the product out of the house and then have it crushed in front of them. Um, only GM would think this was a good idea. I mean, I just, it's still, it's astonishing to me from a brand perspective that someone would do that. But it is in fact what happened. So GM said that basically there just wasn't a market for them. There weren't enough to be interesting to a company like General Motors. And it never appealed beyond you know, the sort of tree huggers and geeks. And, and Martin and I, you know, we're both tree huggers and geeks and we're like, wow, ooh, that's kind of a little close to home. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so maybe they're onto something. Maybe there's only, you know, a handful of us that would really want this. So we looked at what we thought killed the electric car. Not so, there's a movie called Who Killed the Electric Car, which, you know, blames basically GM. But, but I, think, I think it was really about, about what. And the problem was is that, you know, they were low performance, they had, you know, terrible range, and that's really anxiety provoking. You get in the car and you don't know if you're gonna make it to your destination and you can't really refuel very easily. Um, and they all looked really weird. I mean, not the Toyota, but the rest of them looked really strange. Uh, they looked electric for whatever that meant. Um, and they were also t largely targeted at the very low end of the market. And the reason for that is driving electric is super cheap. The cars can be expensive, but the actual, because they're so efficient, uh, you don't, the, 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 the amount of energy that you use per mile is super low. So they can be really inexpensive to, to operate. We took this all and we thought, what can we do with this? So we tried to figure out what kind of car is possible to make. And when I give this a similar presentation to uh, high school students, I tell them we did it all entirely with high school physics and spreadsheets. Um, both Martin and I are quite skilled with Excel. Uh, and Martin has actually taken it beyond skilled, like he's in a, like a totally different world. He made an assembler recently entirely in Excel. For, you know, if you're a computer science person, you're like, what? 
He really did. It was nuts. Uh, he's not a programmer, that's why I think he did it. But anyway, so uh, we did these spreadsheets and we made a model of what was possible. So you could sit there and fiddle with the batteries, you could look at exactly how that would affect the mass, you could say, oh, I want this much range, and you could play with all these parameters. And we came up with a bunch of really interesting things from that model. One is that you could out-accelerate any internal combustion engine car on the market without any, without any trouble, really. It wasn't that hard. And the reason why is electric motors have maximum torque at zero RPM. And then that maximum torque stays completely flat at maximum for a super long period of the torque curve. Which means that when you end, when you step on the accelerator, not only do you get maximum torque, but you get it only, you know, 10 or 20 milliseconds later. Whereas in a gas powered car, you have valves and things going on and flows and air flows and stuff. And it takes like 100 milliseconds or more for, for any torque to develop. Plus you have to do the whole clutching thing and the, in, in the transmission. Electric cars don't have to do any of that. So the, the acceleration is really, really nuts. The lithium ion batteries that we had been experimenting with on the ebook, our second generation ebook was lithium ion batteries. We knew, you know, those had been improving year after year after year, and we knew we could get the range up. And as long as the range was long enough, the fact that we didn't have any, um, any public charging stations didn't matter because most cars are charged at home. I mean, most, most cars live at home most of the time. And you wake up in the morning, and as long as you had enough range, you could wake up, you drive anywhere you want to drive, and then you come home, or you stop at a hotel or whatever, and you just plug it back in again, and the next morning you have a full tank. And this is something that's very different than an internal combustion engine car, where you have to always be looking for, oh, where's that gas station? You know, when you, when you park at night, then you wake up in the morning and you have that full charge. So it's also, of course, was very cheap per mile to, to operate, but we couldn't figure out how, to, how that was appealing to anybody, really, because of the car, kind of car we were having to make. And we had to make kind of an expensive car, because we could not go to high volume. High volume cars require an amazing amount of capital up front. And Martin and I just aren't very good at raising money. So you're know, like, we're not gonna be able to get to, you know, we're not gonna be able to raise hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars on something that has no product match that we know of. So we had to go low volume. And the moment you go low volume, you're gonna be expensive. But the car industry has models for that. In fact, sports cars are frequently quite low volume. It's one of the reasons why they're expensive and they're really quick. So by using that, we could see that, you know, our advantages were for real. We just had to make a better product, something that was actually better than any of the internal combustion engine cars of the time. So we picked a high performance sports car because we could go faster. We could accelerate any internal, the fastest cars you could buy at the time were about four seconds, zero to 60, which is about 100 kilometers, zero to 100 kilometers in four seconds. And as long as we could meet these numbers, we would have a better product. So if you were a sports car enthusiast, if you wanted the quickest car money could buy, it was gonna be our car. And you didn't have to care about being electric, you know, it was just gonna really, it was gonna just like outperform anything. So. We conceived the, the Roadster really as our, our minimum viable product. The idea behind it was that we would develop the drivetrain. And the drivetrain is really about batteries, it's about computers, it's about motors and electronics and networks because all, there's all these computers that have to be networked together. Silicon Valley knows how to do that. You know, like that's, there's lots of software. You know, like we're really good at that. Um, the car thing was a little bit of a mystery as to how we were gonna actually make the car part. So we decided to partner with Lotus. Lotus makes low volume uh, performance cars in a factory in, in England. And they actually had a model that allowed other car companies to come in and, and work with them. So we figured our minimum viable product would be, we would do the drivetrain, like three or four components. They would screw the car together. They had all, all the other stuff. And then we would put what's called a hat on a car. So this is the same platform. This is a Nissan platform. And you can see that one is a minivan and one is a little, little hatchback. They're exactly the same car underneath. They just have a different hat on. The car industry does this all the time. So we would develop a Tesla hat. So it would you know, be brand unique to us. And we'd only have to make a few components of this minimal viable product. Uh, Great, we did all the product development plans. We figured out exactly how we were gonna do everything and sell it and how we were gonna you know, 
make that all work. We wrote the very last business plan in Silicon Valley. No one's ever done this after this. And then we went out and raised money. And pretty quickly we had two small venture firms that said yes. Uh, and then we also found Elon Musk uh, and he led the round. The neat thing about pitching to VCs, you know, or the bad thing about pitching to VCs with a crazy idea is they go, wow, this is a crazy idea. So when we went and pitched to Elon, he was building rocket ships in 2004. Yeah, he had just started, right? He hadn't launched anything yet. So to him, I, I can't imagine what he must think when he, hear, when he hears a pitch and you say, wow, that's crazy. I mean, like he's got, he's building a rocket engine like behind him. Uh, so he said, oh, no brainer, get it. And was in, and invested almost immediately. It was great. He was a, a fantastic supporter of the company. Uh, so we began hiring people. That's J.B. Straubel, uh, the CTO who just, just left uh, after all these years. And by November, we were putting a, our battery pack, our drivetrain basically, into a Lotus Elise shell and our chassis. And this was to sort of test out, it was called a mule. You take parts from one car and parts from another. It isn't what's going to reproduce, but it was, a, it was a, a test bed so that we could test it out. And this was really important because we learned a whole ton, uh, which I'll explain. And we had the, the people designing the hat, uh, the, the uh, Barney, weirdly, Barney Hat is his name, the, the stylist. <laughs> it's, I had never really noticed that, in fact, just until now. Uh, and, and we drove the, the, the mule around. Uh, we got it working the night before a board meeting. So we immediately, we showed it to the board and immediately raised money because that's what you do in Silicon Valley, right? You have something that you show, you de-risk the project, they now had something that they could drive around in and go, wow, this is incredible. This is really different experience than I was expecting. So we raised some more money and learned a whole ton with the mule. And this was expensive learning. What we learned was that the Lotus Elise, the sort of chassis that we were using, was like a $35,000 sports car. And we knew that our price was going to be more like 100000 so things that were acceptable in a $35,000 sports car really weren't okay for our market. And one thing was the doors. The Lotus Elise has these really unusual doors that just are very hard to get into. Uh, in fact, we, we did, you know, we had people get in and out of the car and especially women really had a trouble getting in and out of the car for whatever reason. It just, the, the, it was super low and the doors were very difficult to use. So we had to change that. We realized that that was not a good product fit. We also learned that, that the chassis was a little too small because the batteries are kind of bigger than we thought by the time we put in all the safety equipment that we needed. So the body was going to have to be larger and that meant, and we couldn't make it wider, which is what we really wanted to do because the factory at Lotus grabs a hold of the Lotus at least and it's only so wide. So, it, those machines couldn't handle a wider chassis, so we had to make it longer. It was no problem uh, making it longer. And then we learned a lot of other things that just didn't work very well uh, in, in the sort of body that we would have had or the, 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 the chassis that, that we would have had. So we had to completely redesign the chassis, redesign the heating systems and the cooling systems uh, for the passengers. Uh, uh, electric cars really don't need that for the engine because it doesn't create wa waste heat, which is why you have to have special heaters because there's no waste heat for the engine. So the neat thing is it's like a hairdryer. You have it instantly, but you have to actually you know, build that. The instrument panel, which we thought, the instrument cluster, which we thought was going to be fine, wasn't. So those were all big learnings on our product. And, that, and we had, you know, not focus groups. We had like everyone that we, we're in stealth mode, right? So we had everyone that we knew, you know, kind of, we'd drive up with our, what looked like a Lotus Elise and we'd have people get in and out of it and try to turn it on and try to understand what the instrument cluster said. And, try to get any heat out of the thing or cool or whatever. And we learned a ton. And what that meant was our whole minimum viable product plan didn't work because we had to instead supply hundreds of parts to the factory. And that was going to take a lot longer and a lot more money. The board was incredibly supportive of this because they also saw these shortcomings. And so we took longer, spent more money and designed a better product. Could we have just launched with our first plan, you know, we can't do that A-B test. Unfortunately, with these big devices, you can't just, oh, we'll just do 10 of these and launch and see what works. And then, you know, it doesn't work that way. So we committed. And we don't know if that was really the right decision. We think so. So this just happens to be a baby picture of it in clay. The artists work in clay. 
to start. This is the final version in clay. It's been wrapped in a, in a mylar and then it's digitized and then the moment it's digitized, it's, it's in the digital domain. This is aero testing on the buck, on the, uh, which is just hogged out plastic. We had to build our own motors for a whole separate talk about motors, which we didn't expect. And in April, we said pencils down to all the engineers. We're now done. This is what we think we're going to build. And we built 10 of them. And you know, it's, it's, those are engineering prototypes is what that is called in the industry. And then they came off, the first ones came out of Hethel. And they were beautiful and they were gorgeous. And we were so excited, so we immediately raised money. <laughs> I mean, you know, you have to, you get every time, you know, and this time we had no trouble, you know, we had lots of, lots of interested people in the round. We're still in stealth, but we we're just about to come out. And we had a big coming out party. Uh, Schwarzenegger showed up. He was the governor at the time. And I was worried he wasn't going to fit in the car. The was kind of small. But he's really wide, but he's not very tall. He fit fine. Uh, and he liked it. In fact, I think he bought one a little bit later. Uh, so we came out. We then tested these things like crazy. These, uh, this is, these are durability tracks where they get beaten up. And they, try to, they simulate 100,000 miles and 10 years of wear and tear in like three months. It just about kills the drivers. They have to rotate them constantly. Uh, and the car's flying apart. Pieces are flying off the car and failing like we have millions of failures and every failure has to be traced back to exactly what happened because the mechanical engineers swore none of this was going to happen. Um, <laughs> yet, uh, uh, this, this is uh, testing on the Arctic uh, in a, a frozen lake in Sweden above the Arctic Circle. Uh, this is, all the car companies use these same test tracks and stuff. Uh, so, you know, there's all these spun out Mercedes and everything else, you know, around us as we're going, but the only pictures that are allowed are, are of your car because they're, you know, it's before they can, uh, before they come out. Uh, super fun. We learned a lot there. Thousands and thousands and thousands of changes to our product. And then we said, okay, now we actually know what we're going to build. So we built 10 more, but this was really, you know, after these thousands of changes, they come off the line, uh, sort of a you know, early line, super, you know, I thought the other ones were gorgeous. These were really beautiful and the doors closed and they sounded like they you know, were real cars and you know, this was great. Um, and we could wow any investor. So we raised more money. Uh, and everybody came in and it was, it was great. Uh, and then we were, you know, started producing the, the batteries. We're getting really close to, to actually product delivery. And we had this transmission problem. And you know, if you actually look in the press, you can read about our disasters of the transmission and all the things that went wrong. And this is about the time when Martin, my, my co-founder, who had been CEO this whole time, he gets ousted in sort of a, um, you know, not particularly nice way. But anyway, it's, it's all in the press and you can read that. But it was effectively around this disaster around a transmission that, you know, we had outsourced. We just, it was not part of our, or, you know, it was not something that we thought was going to be a problem. And it turned out to be a real problem. Michael Marks came in. He was the uh, CEO for Flextronics for many years, a giant contract manufacturing house. He was super, unfortunately, he was just about to start something of his own. He said, I can only do this for you know, a few months or whatever, but he was great. Uh, and I, uh, you know, it, was, it was really a pleasure to work with him, super operationally uh, put together. And in September, we had our first sort of track official measurements. And you know, we were under four seconds, so we were just about the fastest sports car money could buy which was what we had predicted from Excel spreadsheets, uh, which is pretty, I mean, math is incredible, right? I mean, you can sit there with a spreadsheet and go, ooh, this is what's going to work. And then, you know, five years later on a track, you're like, oh my gosh, it looks, it's just like, you know, the high school physics said. So in October, we figure out how we're going to redesign the thing. We're, uh, International Rectifier had come out with new transistors, which were more efficient. We could get rid of the transmission and get the product out. Uh, we got a new CEO, a permanent CEO, because because Michael had to leave uh, when he was starting his gig, uh, Zeb Drory, who was not a particularly good fit for the company, but you know, he seemed to be okay at the time. And so he takes over from Michael. And by January, we pass all those, a ton of regulatory stuff. And so we pass all of that. So this is a big deal. Now we can actually sell them if we could only make them go, because we still have this transmission problem we're still fighting. So we had to unfortunately raise a bridge round because we were planning on shipping product then, and we couldn't. But that was, you know, okay. And by June, we actually were de delivering cars. And the most important thing about this is not only did we not lose essentially any customers, even though we were like two years late, and they had paid upfront, 
and they were incredibly loyal and we had all kinds of events and that's a separate talk about how to how to do that with these products that are a little bit late and keep the, the community engaged but they were really happy in the end and this was important we delighted the customers when they got it and I think back to all those changes that we made that cost us so much time and so much money and that iteration that we did and I have to believe that it wouldn't they wouldn't be so happy. I mean, and that would have killed the company if it hadn't been. October, uh, the board loses. <laughs> I don't know what happened with Zev. I wasn't, you know, involved. But anyway, so Zev gets ousted, and Elon takes over, which was a great deal because he had always been incredibly supportive. He had put a huge amount of his own money into the company uh, in ways that were, you know, financially quite risky. I mean, you know, Tesla has never been like a financial secure investment <laughs> and he <laughs> he just believed meanwhile of course he's still trying to get rockets into space and that's causing you know the, he had, it was he was not having a good year that year but anyway he did take over uh, and things got and things got better we had been working on a sedan project for the previous couple of years because the sedan market is like a hundred times larger than the sports car market and if you want to move the needle on oil you got to get in the sedan market you got to get into mass production you got to drive the prices down so we announced that and then I think, you know, by June, this was really important for the investors in the, in the room, if there are any, we IPO'd. All of Silicon Valley depends on exits. You know, it has to have an exit. So this is where we exited. Uh, everyone was super happy. Uh, the stock price, you know, kind of stayed around where it IPO'd for, for quite a while. And by now, of course, the story is a little bit well known. You know, we have all these products out. There's, you know, billions and billions of, of electric miles driven. Uh, there's, you know, the Model S is, uh, is great and there was some, you know, great moments in getting there, which is a whole, you know, separate talk. But, but anyway, Tesla's done super well and I'm really happy with that. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about what's next in that the sustainability thing, um, people say, oh, you know, sustainability, it's kind of a, uh, it's one of those nice to haves. It's, it's, you know, a bunch of, you know, hippies talk about it and stuff, but I don't really have to worry about it. So there's a great quote by Herbert Stein, and he says, if something cannot go on forever, it will stop. And he's an economist, or was, I think, he's, I think he has passed away now. But this is a really important idea, that when you have, you know, when you have products or companies or industries that aren't sustainable, what that's saying is, it will stop. I mean, by definition, it will stop. And the question is, like, what will that do to everybody when it stops? And what will it do to the company? What will it do to the, uh, you know, to the, to the, to the planet when that all comes crashing to, it, to a stop? That's really important to know. And it may be that whatever you're working on is not a problem. It can go on for 100 years, 200 years. It doesn't matter. Or it might be 30 years. And you kind of want to know about that, especially, you know, investors kind of want to know. So in ending, I just want to say disrupting, you know, old industries is really fun. Uh, it, uh, it's fun and profitable, huge opportunities for cool solutions. I'm not a big believer in like going back to the earth and goats and stuff. I really like, um, I, you know, I like rocket ships and, and cool stuff. And everything is going to change. Like it's going to, renewability and sustainability, like that is going to be the future. You know, 50 years from now, it's going to be insane when you look back and we weren't there. It just people will go, how could you possibly have not been thinking about this? And the future is going to be surprising. And I, I leave with this, the most, the biggest surprise that I had is if you had told me that a car that I worked on, that I, you know, <laughs> was going to go blasting into space and end up orbiting the planet for a while until it got blasted off into Mars, you know, and it's now like by the asteroid belt, I would have said, that is completely insane. There is no, and yet, that is exactly what happened to me. And it's for real, like you can go and you can track it. There's actually Star, Starman Tracker, which it shows you where in the asteroid belt it happens to be at the moment. It's completely insane. Anyway, I want to thank you and I'm willing to take questions or happy to take questions. Leave that up there. Questions if you want. Yeah, and actually, I just read like it was like two or three days ago. It just finishes the first a revolution around the sun, apparently. So that's so great. Yeah, it, yeah. the warranty on that one is. All right, cool. So the way questions yeah. work, you have to have a microphone. So raise your hand, and we have two mic runners here. We'll get you microphones. All right, here we go. 
If you don't have a mic, just wait for a mic, okay? Uh, sustainability. What about the batteries that eventually run out? What's the plan for all that? Right, yeah, how, how do you recycle the batteries? Um, so lithium ion batteries actually are quite recyclable. Uh, they're, the metal around them is recyclable. Lithium itself is recyclable. Uh, and then there's a vanishingly small amount of cobalt in them. And the cobalt is super valuable. And it's sort of the thing that drives the cost of the recycling or drives the, the uh, performance of the recycling, a little bit like aluminum does in the, your normal recycling thing, in that it's the thing that makes the money. So lithium ion batteries, you know, and they're not toxic. So if you think about lead acid batteries that are super toxic, lead is you know, not good. Uh, and even the alkaline batteries that are not okay to throw into a landfill. Uh, actually, lithium ion batteries are the only batteries you can throw into a landfill because they actually are, aren't even toxic. But you would never do that because they have recycling value. So you, you, one can do it. So um, how, are, you, are you involved in the Model Y production? Or? No, I'm not at Tesla anymore. Oh, okay. I left as we were delivering the roadsters to that happy customer. <laughs> Sorry. All right, so thank you uh, for the super funny, uh, inspiring talk. Uh, my question is, uh, so when you were running two years late, uh, how did you justify that uh, to the investors? Uh, and also to yourself, like, were you scared? And like, how did you overcome that, uh, that situation, the whole scenario? I mean, it was a disaster, I mean, to be so late. Um, but on the other hand, so we had the support when we were slipping the schedule for reasons of redesign and stuff. Those were reasons that you know, the board agreed with. So we worked really carefully with the board, and Elon was the chairman of the board, and said, you know, we think that you know, making these changes, taking this extra time, you know, spending more money, is going to be the right thing for the product. Uh, and the board was incredibly aligned with, with our view on that. So that was really important. What was more astonishing to me is that we kept almost all of our customers. In fact, I think the only customers we lost along that whole time, there was a, a person who suddenly had twins. <laughs> and he's like, this is really not going to work. My wife says, this is really not going to work. Uh, but but uh, other than that, uh, we really didn't have uh, a problem with it. And it was because of something we, that, that a, a consultant had, had brought in called managed transparency. And so as we had setbacks, we didn't hide them. We, you know, we explained them. We had a blog you know, for the owners, it was the owners only, for the people who had purchased the car you know, in advance. And you know, every week or so, we would show what was going on in the company. And you know, we didn't show every little detail and every little disaster, obviously. But, but along the way, the, the big things, you know, we said, oh, shoot, look at, you know, we're having really trouble with cold weather, you know, or whatever it was. And we would explain what we did and how we tested it. And people actually really appreciated that. They came along with the for the journey with us, and they understood all the testing we were doing. This was not some, you know, you're just throwing a product out. You know, like they're, they're never going to drive on an ice lake in, you know, Sweden. But they know they could now, right, because we've been working on that. Uh, and we, you know, we'd explain these setbacks in time. So, and we had parties. We, we threw parties for the various uh, customers. Uh, fortunately, there were you know, um, roadster, you know, sports cars are largely sold in like LA and Miami and, and here and stuff. So we could, we could, with a few geographic parties, we could, we could um, have meetups basically and, and talk to our customers. It was, uh, uh, they were incredibly supportive the whole time. Were you ever under the risk of getting bought over by another car company? or under pressure like why aren't we delivering something like those guys? Oh no, the, the, the other car companies thought we were insane. Like there was never, in fact, one of, the, one of the things that we would frequently talk about, you know, the board would talk about uh, was, you know, when the Roadster comes out and the car companies really understand what's possible with electric cars and we we're going to be years away from getting the sedan out, which we naively thought would be, you know, like an additional three or four years. I can't remember what, we, what our original projection was. There was going to be this time when we as a little company would be trying to scale up and trying to understand how to do that, where the big guys would, you know, they could, they could devote a billion dollars and just make it happen. So we were very, very concerned about getting crushed in that period between the Roadster and the Model S. No, at no time did any of the board discussions say, you know, what if they didn't do anything until like five years later, when after the Model S gets released, 
and they still didn't do anything for another like four or five years. <laughs> and, and, you know, and it's only when the Model S became the top selling sedan in luxury sedan in Germany that they really began to panic. What if we had like that 10 year runway? I mean, you know, so that was never a discussion that we had at the board, at least that I was aware of. So no, they, they, we were not, it, as it turned, we were worried about it, but nobody ever did. Um, curious to learn more about the user testing you did and did you, um, like what sample sizes were good enough for you and how did you involve the customers in sort of the testing and development process? Oh, that's a good question. So after we were out of stealth, stealth mode, so a lot of the testing we did was with the, with the, um, with the mule and we had some what are called bucks. They're sort of mock-ups of cockpit and stuff. And we would bring in literally friends and family. Um, you know, by that time we had, you know, 100 employees, so they had a lot of friends and stuff. Um, what, one of the funniest ones was uh, we had these, you know, prototypes, these mules that would be around and we're in San Carlos and uh, I, I, look, I look out and there's police cars, you know, like all over the back of the, of the place, you know, where the cars are. I'm like, oh no, like what did somebody do? So I go out to go to talk to the police and it turned out that one of our employees, his high school buddy is a policeman. And so all these policemen came to look at the car because they had seen him around. <laughs> and I was like so relieved. I thought, oh, I thought we were going to be shut down for sure. I mean, we were doing anything illegal, but you know, they would drive spirit, spiritedly sometimes. That's what I was worried about. Uh, but so we had, we even got feedback from the cops. You know, they, they said, oh, this is really neat. Uh, we didn't do anything. We, so there's a couple of iterations of that. So we had the friends and family uh, part, obviously, and then as we had the engineering prototypes, so we had the things that we really thought this is what we're going to make. In the car industry, there's an entire uh, sort of a ride and handling uh, protocol that's done. So every time we'd make a change to the car, they would they would be a, a, a test examiner. It was a little bit like getting your driving test, you know, and they would sit in the passenger side, and then they would tell you what to do, and they would say, you know. Uh, come to a complete stop, you know, accelerate here or whatever. And sometimes we do it on a closed track. Sometimes if it was meant to be, if the tests were meant to be on, you know, roads, we, you know, we do that and we, you know, be, you know, be careful of the speed limits. But, uh, and then they would ask us, how did that feel? You know, was that, you know, and they would, they, and we also had accelerometers and stuff, which would tell them if it was jerky or not jerky and stuff. So there is this sort of standardized protocol for getting uh, feedback from, from prototype cars, so we would do that. But that was only after we had actual engineering samples that we could we could play with. Hi. So um, the question is, in your view, uh, what is the biggest problem that's uh, preventing or slowing down the the adoption of electric cars by uh, mainstream consumers nowadays, say United States? Or, or another way to approach the problem is, what are the most important important problem that's worth solving? that will help the world uh, to move toward uh, adoption of uh, electric cars you know, as, a, as a major product, as, as the go-to option mm -hmm. today. To, yeah, so they're expensive. I mean, you know, they, the price point keeps coming down because the batteries are on kind of a slow Moore's Law curve. They get a little cheaper and a little bit better every year. But it's not like Moore's Law where it's, you know, every 18 months they, they're tw twice as good. Uh, and so it's a slow doubling, like about 10 years, it becomes you know, half, the, half the price or twice the performance or whatever. That initial cost is, is you know, not just because the cars are not in huge volume, it's that the battery technology is still pretty expensive. Now it has been getting cheaper at a faster rate because as the battery market for cars is so huge. So an example is when we started in 2003, uh, a, a typical battery, a, a typical cell company their dream customer was that the, someone would buy seven cells in their, they'd have seven cells at any given time. That was a camcorder, you know, a couple cells in a camcorder, a couple cells in a laptop, a couple of extra batteries for the laptop and the camcorder, uh, and maybe a cell phone. That was their dream was seven cells. The Roadster had 7,000. So the market was a thousand times larger than they anticipated. And that investment, that, that, realization that the market is so very, very much bigger for batteries than they ever imagined has driven a lot of innovation and a lot of, of production reduction in costs. So Bloomberg Energy uh, produces a, you know, a cost curve of, of lithium ion cells and they've had to revise it every year, their projections, because frequently, uh, in fact every year, they've had to make them drop faster than they thought possible. 
Uh, and I, so we will get price parity, you know, at some point, but we're still probably, I don't know, five or six years away at least, you know, uh, and it's going to be price parity. At, you know, the Model 3 is pretty close, you know, for that cost of car, for that style of car. But, you know, you really want to drive it down to about the $20,000 price point, and it's super hard. But we'll get there. Hey, Mark. Mm -hmm. I'm Jordan. Hey, Jordan. Um, thanks for being here and giving this presentation. It's been awesome. Uh, so my question is, when it came to um, the initial founding team, what was the process of figuring out who to bring on, like how to hire, how to source, and how to vet them to make sure that they had the technical ability to um, build the initial road suit? Yeah, well, the great thing about doing something so outlandish is that no one that we talked to had any of the skills we needed. Like, there was just like, it's not going to happen. Uh, so uh, we were, you know, we, we looked for really smart, motivated people. Uh, and we were able, because of the mission, we were able to get people that we could never have possibly afforded. Uh, in, in, you know, we, we didn't have that much money. We couldn't possibly pay them what they were getting, you know, at Intuit or, or at, at, at Google. Uh, but they were so enamored with the mission, they were willing to come over, and you know they were great. You know, and they really, really helped. We had trouble filling certain roles; we just you know couldn't do it, uh, and we had to then train people. You know, we'd say, "Okay, you got to go figure this out." I mean, you know, this is you know, call all of your you know Stanford professors or whatever, whoever you've got, but you know we've got to get the power electronics to do whatever it's supposed to do. Uh, but it was hard, and and now a lot of those skills are actually sort of back in vogue. So an example is the power electronics. You know, there were no universities left in the country that taught power electronics. Because actually the U of I, U of I had, had a program, but that was it. And you know, we couldn't find any people that could deal with real voltage. So things like that. I mean, you know, you'd be like, oh, you know, it's four volts. You know? And I'm like, no, they were at 400. <laughs> and and you know, when, when you step on the accelerator, it's over 1,000 amps at four volts, so, or four, 400 volts. So it's like for real. Uh, but so. We looked for really smart people who were motivated and would figure it out. That was kind of the base. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wait. The microphone's got to go. Hey, Mark, knowing now how the market has developed, would in retrospect, you know, would you do something differently or in the engineering, knowing how the market has developed today? Yeah, I, I think knowing how the market, I mean, we did, I think, as best we could given the amount of money that we could raise. Now, Martin and I just aren't very good at raising money. Uh, we know that because Shai Agassi, uh, who is an, the SAP's number one sales person, and if you've ever used SAP, if you can sell that, <laughs> you, you know, you are good. Like, there is no question. And, and so, so, so Shai was able to raise, you know, he was out with Better Place and he was raising hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, but he didn't have a plan yet, right? <laughs> and, and we had all of these, you know, prototypes and we had all this data and we had, you know, we had done everything, you know, and we're trying to raise, you know, $10 million. And he is raising hundreds of millions with, I mean, he's just, I'm going to save the world. I'm going to make it a better place. And like, oh, here's a hundred million. And we couldn't, so, so given our inability to actually raise huge amounts of money. I don't think we could have done much better. Uh, I think we, we made pretty good choices along the way. I mean, there was some you know, mistakes, obviously, uh, the transmission being one of them, but uh, that I, I'm not sure we would have done much different. Uh, and, and we certainly couldn't have started with a, with a sedan. We just didn't know enough. We learned so much from the Roadster that the sedan was, was just an enormously better product because we understood what we were doing then. Considering it's a new technology and it's like pretty expensive car, how did you manage to bring the first few customers in? So how do we manage to get the first few customers in? So, you know, Tesla has never advertised. We could never afford it. Uh, and it's still, Tesla has never run an ad. Uh, it's, people were drawn, actually our, our initial, uh, you know, you know, thousand customers were, were really interesting. There was a segment of them that were, uh, really committed to sustainability, I mean, real, and zero emissions uh, for environmental reasons. And so we marketed that, you know, we, you know, we didn't run ads, but we would show up in the right places um, around Silicon Valley and, and LA and stuff for people that were interested in that kind of thing. Uh, there was also uh, a group of people who were really interested in not using oil for national security reasons. 
which was something that we hadn't really anticipated, uh, but we're, we're, you know, we're quite interested in. And those people um, really didn't care at all about you know, the, the environmental aspects of it. They were really just concerned about the geopolitical aspects of buying oil. So that was, you know, an interesting community, largely driven by, you know, like the CIA and the intelligence community. So we had some really interesting initial customers. Uh, and then uh, there was also the gearheads that were delightful, and they didn't care what the car consumed as long as it went really, really fast. Um, and, 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 you know, we, there, and it turns out that those three market segments uh, were initially, you know, we were kind of even, you know, a lot of these. So the, the meetups we'd have were, were really interesting because, you know, uh, and, uh, but, you know, they were all really great customers that, that believed in the mission, but from different, different perspectives. We were able to, you know, we had these little soirees. We would uh, reach out to uh, car enthusiast groups and EV enthusiast groups. There were this whole home built EV, you know, community out there. And, you know, people would place orders. Uh, it was uh, crazy. And we actually originally didn't have that in the business plan where they would pay in advance. That was something we kind of, you know, learned that people were willing to do. They were so into it. They would write these very large checks and just hand us a check and say, I believe so much in what you're doing. I, you know, if this can help not have you go out of business, I want to do that. And that's the, you know, like you don't get better customers than that. They were awesome. Uh, hi, Mark. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, curious, besides the Lotus Roaster option, did you have a like, claim bleed? Uh, absolutely. see other options that didn't come through? Yeah, so we had, we had scanned around the world looking for uh, companies that could build in sort of low volume, because low volume production is a, is a different beast than the high volume production. And, and, and also that could have a, that had some mechanism for dealing with making somebody else's car. So, you know, Toyota isn't going to make somebody else's car. But Lotus, they made the Opel Speedster for GM. They made, uh, they, had, they had done this several times before. They had a group that did that. But so did Noble in South Africa, which has, there's a big car industry in South Africa. And there was another one uh, in Britain that we looked at that, that had, had done this for other car companies for, for their sort of niche products that, you know, the big guys weren't, like GM wasn't going to spin up a line for some low volume sports car. So they just had Lotus do it for them, for example. So we had several options, but Lotus was our number one, uh, our, our pick. It seemed like the best match of what we were looking for. But we did have plan B and C. Hi, Mark. Uh, speaking of developing hard to iterate products, uh, other than raise money whenever you have a success to sell, uh, what are the top two or three lessons you could share with us that could be broadly applicable to developing super, super hard to iterate and super expensive products? Yeah, I mean, I really do think you have to do a tremendous amount of homework to make sure that where your initial product is going to be um, is going to be pretty close to what, what they want. I mean, you know, you, if we had suddenly pivoted and say, you know, we're going to do Tesla branded toasters or something, that really wouldn't have worked with the investors, right? You got to actually really, really, you know, have, have researched it. Um, I think that getting something for the for customers to play with, you know, we we did have. Um, and the car industry does this all the time. They have these, these, these interior bucks where it's just the interior of the car. It's actually just plywood everywhere else. You know, just, and, that, and we thought, oh, this looks so funny. And then, then one of the people that we had hired from um, you know, one of the giant car companies goes, oh, yeah, we always use two by fours. We didn't use the plywood. You know, like that was completely normal. But the inside, you know, we would play with that and we would have people look at that. And you just want to iterate the little pieces that you can do when you can do it. And even if it looks a little bit goofy, I mean, you know, we'd bring people in and they would go, whoa, and then they'd get into it and they'd go, oh, this is kind of like a car. I get it now. So we would do stuff like that to, to, to iterate on the small scale. The, the problem is these long development cycles, you just can't do much. Oh, the other thing that we did, which the car industry hated, so we actually couldn't use the suppliers for this in a normal sense, is that they like everything spec'd out years in advance. Uh, and that's just, you know, we can't do that in Silicon Valley. So an, an example is the, the body controller, which is a thing in your car that makes the, you know, the windshield wipers go up and down and the, and the door and the, and the windows go up and down. And, the, and they need that spec'd out. They make them really well. They make them really cheap. They're really durable. And you have to have everything exactly specified. All of the behavior is completely, completely dialed in. If you're willing to pay for an accelerated program, it takes about two and a half years to make that. It's just a little tiny computer on a, on a board 
with a bunch of power transistors on it, really, uh, and some redundancy to make sure uh, you know you don't turn the headlights off accidentally. And you know that was an example of something that that we couldn't do that. We couldn't spec that out because we wanted to be able to change the behaviors and to delight the customer in ways we hadn't anticipated. So we designed everything, you know, we did that ourselves. And, you know, again, that's something Silicon Valley does really well. It only took us a few months to get a body controller built. And that allowed us to be changing stuff all the time, including in production. Uh, and that is still the case that we change, you know, Tesla changes stuff during the production cycle in a way that no other car company does. So normal car companies really don't introduce something except at the model year changes. And Tesla, the moment they get something that they think is better, they just they put it in. Um, it causes an enormous amount of regulatory sort of uh, record keeping, but it's worth it because then you can iterate. And like my Tesla, one of the very first Model S's, is way better than when I bought it. It's the only car that I've ever owned that has steadily gotten better because the software, I have all these new features, I can control it with my phone, I can do all these crazy things that when I bought the car, I couldn't do it because everything was in software. So that's, that's the best I can think of. Hi, Mark. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, in terms of regulations, how did you deal with them? Like, did you have to design them into your product requirement stock? And then did you treat them differently between the validation prototypes and earlier prototypes? Well, the regulations are, you know, only affect uh, the things you're going to sell, the final. Uh, you know, the, 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 this, it's called FMVSS, uh, Federal Vehicle Motor Safety Standards or whatever. And there's a, an enormous book of those as to uh, what you have. To, that includes all the crash tests and everything. So from the very beginning, you know, we designed for that in mind, and we actually hired people that knew how to, to do that, you know, that, that, that knew how to do the failure analysis required to, to be safe. Um, and we were, you know, there's those requirements, but that really isn't good enough. You've really got to go a lot further than, than the actual um, FMVSS. Uh, so we hired industry people that knew how to do it. And they, you know, drove some of the engineers crazy, but, you know, it was completely the right thing. It was not an option. Hey, Martin. Yeah. So my question is sort of you touched on that kind of earlier, but um, disrupting a whole industry, meaning that there's some people that have been doing these things for, like, a long time, right? Mm -hmm. So at what point did you guys even try to bring anyone from the old industry, like from the OEM, and how did you make the determination? Right. So there were certain things that... Uh, we discovered we were completely incompatible with. So, for example, that body controller. We couldn't engage the car industry in that way. We couldn't use those suppliers because they were not, they didn't operate in the same speed that we needed. Uh, however, there were people who, you know, design bodies, for example. And that's, you know, we're not, that, that we want one of those, one of those people that knows how to do that. There's a, an entire industry or entire ecosystem of of the mechanical engineers around cars that come onto projects and do a lot of the mechanical work and a lot of the and the crash validation work and stuff to make sure that when the car is hit. So it's like modern cars, you know, they're much much safer than they used to be. And part of it is that they're modeled really intensely. So it isn't that you do a crash test and you, you pass or you don't. What they do is they model like lots of possible crashes and lots of possible manufacturing variances and make sure that all of them are safe. And then you actually crash the real cars. Uh, they're heavily instrumented and all it's doing is making sure that the computer model matches. Uh, so you, you end up with, you know, much, you, they crash it thousands of times in simulation. Uh, so those kinds of people, that kind of expertise, you know, we hired because you know, there was no way we were going to add any value to that and, and they knew what to do. And then a lot of things in the car industry are around internal combustion engines. So, you know, that was not something that was interesting to us. And the funny part about the big guys um, is they largely only have kept the final assembly and the internal combustion engine design and, and, and manufacture. Everything else is out, outsourced. Uh, in fact, even some of the final assembly is outsourced. One of the bigger uh, outsourced vendors that we could have had make the car they were they they're they're like bigger production volumes is magnus steyr and they make you know bmw x3s and stuff bmw doesn't make those they just contract it out they outsource it to to a company so um you know we picked and choose the ones that made sense well thank you for your presentation i want to say that the future of tesla should be pretty good because my 11 year old son 
is is obsessed with Tesla. He doesn't even drive, but when he becomes a professional baseball player, he's going to buy a Tesla. <laughs> Excellent. And Excellent. all of his friends, too. They all love Tesla, and they talk about all the time. And we don't know one yet. Okay. Um, my question is, would you have been able to launch and iterate without the financial support of Elon Musk? Well, so Elon was the single single biggest investor. We certainly needed um, his support at the beginning. Well, so we had another venture firm that was interested. And, you know, we wonder like what that would have been like uh, if, if they had invested. Uh, you know, we were pretty sure that they were going to invest. And then Elon, you know, came in and, and, you know, he, you know, got the mission and was, you know, a true believer and, you know, wrote the same checks. <laughs> Uh, you know, we don't have any regrets for, for doing that, but we might have, we probably would have been able to raise money uh, from, from different sources. I mean, we were, we were pretty, we were in the sort of final throes of, a, of a, another VC as well uh, when and we, we, you know, we preferred uh, Elon in that case. So I think it would have been possible, you know, because you can't really know. I mean, you know, would the money have dried up or would, would, would we have been, a, you know, who knows? And would, would that venture capitalists been as interested in making the product delightful uh, as Elon was, uh, you know, probably not, so. Hi, Mark. Thank you for your amazing presentation again. So my question is, um, so EV definitely is a disruptive technology and is really bringing a lot of changes in the industry. How do you feel about the other key feature of a Tesla, namely auto driving? Yeah, the self-driving aspect. Yeah. So that is something that I, you know, <laughs> I'm not that familiar with actually in my in my Model S, you know, mine is really really early. It's like one of the very first. So I don't have any of that. So I can't uh, you know, I haven't even really experienced it. As a software person though, you know, self-driving is really quite a difficult trick to master. And I think that we're going to get there. I think Tesla will get there. I think all these other companies will get there. I think it's going to be much more limited uh, for, I just don't see jumping in the car and saying, take me to New York, and it, it does that. I can easily imagine it, um, and I think this might be more useful, as you pull up to a parking garage and you go say, go park yourself, and you leave. I think that's quite doable, and that's the kind. So I don't know when and where. It's going to be enormously disruptive, and that's why everybody's so interested in it. Um, and it does enable all kinds of really fun business models and stuff. So I'm actually optimistic, but we're not as close as I had hoped. Um, but when Google demoed it, you know, 10 years ago or whatever, it was astonishing because nobody thought we were remotely that close 10 years ago. Hi, Mark. Yeah. Um, my name is Ahmed. I just uh, moved to the Bay Area from Michigan, worked there for five mm -hmm. years at General Motors. Oh, fantastic. Uh, so here with a couple other people from General Motors. Um, so many times we would, and funny enough, we, a couple of us also worked in the innovation team at General Motors, and we kept saying, we got to act more like Tesla, we got to be more user-centered. So that's a lot of the stuff that we did. So it's really surreal being here, like hearing you talk about this. So, um, so I was wondering if you could just share maybe a story or two of when you spoke with somebody from a GM, and they told you you were crazy, and you kind of, what your response was, because I got a lot of crazy. Yeah. Well, okay, two quick, very quick stories come to mind. First off, have you met Bob Lutz when you were at GM? No. He, he, Bob Lutz is like this famous, you know, curmudgeonly old guy um, who, uh, who we talked to a couple of times, and he was great. Uh, and he actually, he said that the reason why they built the, the, the Volt and then later the Bolt was uh, because of Tesla. And he, uh, he told us that privately, and then and then actually told it to the auto press at the Detroit Auto Show in front of, you know, 100 reporters. And then GM, of course, immediately issued a press release saying that Bob had misspoke, that, <laughs> that, that uh, uh, you know, that, that it, you know, there had always been the plan to make, you know, plug-in hybrids and, and, and electric cars, and that, you know, he had just misspoken. And then he issued his own press release. <laughs> Uh, so he was he was great. Uh, the the so that was a, that was a case, that was a funny interaction. Um, and we, we had a couple of trips to GM that were for, for fascinating. Uh, and then the other thing that was an interesting thing about just the car industry in general was that frozen lake that that I showed. Uh, that is a you know it's one of these famous test tracks that people use. And so I'd sent the team there, our you know engine our, our motor control people and the people interacting with the traction control and everything. 
and they would you know get their slot on, and you drive the car and you're a professional driver and they would you know spin out or whatever and and you know we had it heavily instrumented and it's all done in software so you know they would you know get back into the little warming hut thing meanwhile you know mercedes is going next and then volvo and stuff and they all have these these slots because the lake is only frozen for a certain number of months so it's it's quite uh busy and our guys would sit there and beaver away on you know looking at the data and figure out what happened and go click 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 and they would burn in some new some new stuff and then they would go and and try it and by the end of a couple of days um it was traction control and everything was perfect so mission accomplished they got back on the plane, flew back, everyone's happy. We get an immediate halt of the program from Lotus. And the reason why was because you shouldn't be able to do that. That should have taken months because you, you, know, you had to go back to Stuttgart or whatever and, and work with the vendors and, and adjust knobs or whatever it is that they did in other cars. And it was supposed to take months and months and months. And we declared victory in you know, a few days. So we had to have been doing something fraudulently, basically. So it, you know, we, it took us about 10 days to kind of unstick the program uh, that it was red lighted because we convinced them that actually, you know, when you do everything in software and it's all you know, under control and, you under, and you're the vendor, you understand what you're doing, it's just not that hard of a problem. Uh, and, and, and that, I think, was a real shock to the, to, to the and, and Lotus is quite nimble. I mean, that, the thing is, is that, you know, one of the reasons we went with Lotus is because they're kind of scrappy and don't have enough, you know, resources either. And, and they got a lot of what we were doing. But like that was a, that was, and they, you know, they came and really queried us about it because they were very, initially very concerned. And then they were like, ooh, we, we need to understand this more because that shouldn't have been, you know, that was outside of our business model. Anyway, so that's an example of that impedance mismatch between the old, old and the new. Thanks for sharing the amazing stories. And I have a question about, as you mentioned, uh, research is very important. And I would like to know more about if there's any other way to afford, to figure out the potential problems before, even before MVP. Basically. Oh, yeah, I, you know, research, uh, you know, I don't know, we ran it by all of our friends who largely thought we were crazy, but you know, we did get some value. I don't know how you, you do it without having anything to test you know i mean you, you literally just run the idea through as many people as you could we talked to you know hundreds of family and friends and crazy investors and all kinds of things saying this is what we're planning on doing you know what do you think and you know some of their feedback was really useful I, you know, it's, it's a long time ago too it's hard to remember but i think that's what we did uh, were you able to leverage any rapid prototyping techniques uh, like seeing as emergence of 3d printing and other Oh yeah, oh totally, yeah. Well, so, so we didn't do them for production, but uh, we, you know, we didn't we didn't allow our guys to have a machine shop or anything really for a long time, because we didn't want them to go and make them make stuff themselves. Uh, and it turns out in San Carlos, where we were based, there's a lot of prototyping houses around, so we would frequently um, have stuff you know turned either CNC'd or or sometimes 3D printed. In 2004 and five, the 3D printing wasn't very good. For plastic parts, you could do it, but for metal parts, you know, it didn't really work very well. Uh, but we would certainly have them CNC'd and stuff very, very quickly and, and turn around. And, you know, sometimes within an hour or two, you know, we would you know, run over and grab some new parts that, that you know, design. So, you know, we did uh, as much of that as we possibly could. Yeah, no, that was it, was, it was enabling. And on the electronic side, that's something that also had happened relatively recently in, in that time frame was that you could also turn PCBs, especially here in Silicon Valley, you could do that very, very quickly. So if we had something that even we couldn't fix with blue wires, um, you know, we could turn the design um, in 24 hours. It's coin operated, you know, the more coins you put in, the faster it goes. So, you know, we could, we could turn that. I think just, we have time for maybe one more question. Sure. Is that? I have one question. Uh, thank you for the uh, presentation. Uh, my question is, how do you deal with um, setbacks um, when, when you know um, with investors with uh, customers or even uh, employee when you know something bad happened uh, I mean this oh, is common for startups. yeah we had lots of lots of those so one thing that I think is is important is so Martin and I have different personalities and what you know I, I don't know how solo founders make it happen because 
in any given moment in a startup's you know life, it's either you know hopeless or you're going to take over the world. There's not much in between, really. You know, <laughs> and and it's really important that that the other founder or group of founders is in the flip side of that equation. You don't ever want to be synchronized, right? Because then you know then you give up. Uh, and so as a solo, if I was a solo founder, you know, it wouldn't have been possible because I would have just given up. It's you know, like, oh, this is another disaster. And like, you know, I can't. It, but, but because we were never in sync that way, uh, it worked. And you have an exec staff that's, you know, really committed and, and, and gets through those. The, the other thing is that as you have setbacks, um, I learned this from, from a, my boss that I, I worked with uh, right out of college. And he was a turnaround artist. That's what he, you know, he. That's what the company employed him for was to save disaster, you know, projects that were, you know, it had literally caught fire sometimes. Uh, and he had this pipe, and he would, you know, like something would burst into flames. And he was famous for one time walking over to a computer that was literally burning and stopping to relight his pipe as he went over to to research it. Uh, but that approach of kind of stepping, taking a step back, and always, never panicking, and always going, okay, so that didn't work very well or you know that vendor just collapsed or you know that supply chain thing that we were so dependent on isn't going to work for us and not and not panicking and not making rash decisions and sort of sleeping on it and take cuz almost nothing requires action immediately and i think taking that moment to kind of consider all your options and getting input from everybody else to see how we're going to solve this and that sort of helped us i think as well because then the teams didn't feel like, oh, this was a disaster. They'd be like, okay, now we have to figure out how we're going to solve this. You know, some of it is just attitude and, and some of it is just making sure that you're not synchronized with the, you know, we're doomed uh, meme. So anyway, thank you very much.